Okay, great. Welcome to Food Travel Talk TV, a monthly talk show brought to you by the World Food Travel Association, the world's leading authority on food and beverage tourism. Food Travel Talk TV was created by and for the world's culinary travel trade. Our goal with the show is to inspire us all with ways to help us do business better. Every month, we invite industry thought leaders, opinion makers, and trendsetters to discuss important topics for our industry's benefit. My name is Eric Wolf, and I'll be your host today for our September 2021 episode, number 17. This month's topic is the resiliency of women in the male-dominated food industry. And I'd like to introduce our guest, Hannah Howard, who is the author of Plenty, a memoir of food and family. Hi, so glad to be here. Feel free to post your questions at any time in the Q&A window. We will reserve the last 20 minutes or so to answer your questions. Now I'd like to set the tone for today's episode. Google the most famous chefs in the world and you will notice something interesting and also a little strange. Most of them are men. But how can that be when women represent half the population? And let's take that one step further and think about where our family dishes and recipes come from. It's usually our mothers and grandmothers who do the cooking and the handing down of this tradition. So why are the most famous chefs mostly men? Welcome, Hannah. <laughs> Can you answer that question for us? <laughs> Tell us more about this issue. Not, not a big question or anything. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here um, and talk about this big topic. Um, so I, I'll, 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 zoom, I'll zoom out a little bit and then I'll, I'll get there soon. Um, but my first career, now I'm a, I'm a writer, but my first career was in working in restaurants and I worked in restaurants because I've always loved food. I thought I wanted to have my own restaurant someday. And this amazing adventurous career took me um, many to many cities, to, to New York, to Philadelphia, to LA. I was a cheesemonger. I worked in the front of the house mostly. I worked a little bit in the back of the house. And along the way, I had some really incredible mentors. And when I stopped to think about it, I realized that they were all men. And um, that kind of sat weird with me. It seemed, it seemed strange. Why should that be? Um, and I think you kind of touched on it with your question itself, which is that um, you know, women have been cooking and feeding people for as long as there have been people <laughs> Um, and so often the, the heart of, of the domestic culinary life, but when it came to restaurants, which are a relatively new invention in the world the last few hundred years and food as a public, um, a thing in the public sphere, they have been really dominated by, by men. And there's, there's many reasons for that from the, these traditional gender roles and, you know, a sort of assumption that men cooking something feels more like serious artwork and women cooking something is more like just grandmother's tradition. Um, and then there's little, there's all these tentacles and aspects of this issue, like um, men supporting each other. In At least in the US, it's so, so much more common for uh, men to get like business, small business loans and the loans are in greater amounts. So there, and then the industry itself is kind of famously um, antisocial in terms of its hours and not incredibly hospitable to families and women who want to have kids. Um, so there's, there's like all these sort of challenges along the way um, and lots of reasons that so many of those famous chefs were Googling our men. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. And I guess as a man, it's not something I've noticed, but actually that's not true. I, I have noticed it because you look at some of the shows on TV and stuff. And I, I have said to myself, wow, where are the women? You know, I mean, <laughs> it, it's, um, I don't know, it's, it's a strange phenomenon. And now that, that this has come to light, actually uh, it's, it's a thing. And I guess our, What's, what's happening to change this phenomenon now? I think that this is just like a, a slow but exciting shift happening where I, there, like, there was a food and wine 
um, issue a few years ago. It was featuring rock star chefs and they were all men. And there was so much um, kind of frustration in response to that. And, and to me, that's just like one little piece of this landscape where people are saying, right, like, hey, why are all of these faces, male faces? Um, and there's women opening restaurants and pursuing other food and hospitality ventures and getting slowly but surely, I feel like more attention, accolades, funding, legitimacy, respect, love. Um, so I, I don't, I think we have so such a long way to go, but I, I think that there's, um, you, you know, there's like media, there's Cherry Bomb magazine that celebrates women in the food world. There's, I, I'm, I'm groups of, I'm part of groups of um, more low key women supporting each other in the cheese world or in the food media world. So it's, it's happening, but I think it's just a long, a long road when you have decades and generations of doing things one way. Hmm. So how is that change then happening? I mean, are, are women just waking up one morning and saying, this is it, I'm going to, I'm going to be part of the change or are there programs in place or does it vary by region or country? So that's a great question. I think um, it's not that this is, it's not that women haven't been chefs and restaurateurs before. I think they have, they have been for, forever. I, I was just, um, I, I teach a food writing class and we were reading um, some Edna Lewis, who is uh, the granddaughter of, of slaves who owned a restaurant in the 1950s in New York City. Um, so this is not new, but I think the focus is newly awake, like people are just opening their eyes a little bit more. Um, and I think it absolutely varies by region. So um, yeah, so my, my book, Plenty, that just came out, um, profiles some women in the food world doing really wonderful work. And when I set out to write it, I kind of started thinking that the women I would talk to would be these kind of really accomplished luminaries in their field. And I started to do some research and some interviews and the people that I really connected with were not necessarily, I mean, they're very, they're definitely impressive people in the book and some of them have really done incredible things, but they were kind of more in the trenches, getting their hands dirty, um, working. One of the first chapters is about my friend, my now friend, um, Paula, who, is a chef um, who lives outside of Milan. And she was um, the only woman on the line in a Michelin starred restaurant in Modena for enough time to real, like it, to her, her experience was just that it was a an abusive, awful situation. And um, the whole culture there, it's very, it's very old school, it's very, um, it's inspired by the military system as kitchens traditionally are. And, she, you, you know, she was, everyone kind of gets abused, but I, as, a, as the only woman, it was really intense and it wasn't like what she saw for herself and she didn't see a future there. And so she moved on to, now she runs her own online cooking school. So she's kind of channeled her love for food, but, changed like she wanted to be more in control of her destiny and her job so I feel like it depends right these people depending on their specific passions where they live in the world their resources um the women that I got to know were all pursuing their culinary dreams in really different ways but they were all doing it mm. you know it's interesting you mentioned Italy and I live in Spain and I am. I was just thinking as you were talking about all the restaurants I've been to, I cannot remember seeing a woman chef in Spain. I'm sure there are, but you know, in the past few months, which I haven't eaten out that much, but still, I don't recall any woman. And just for work and, and vacations and stuff, I've been a lot to Greece and I'm thinking about those trips in Greece and I don't recall a lot of women in the kitchen there either. And 
Southern Europe has traditionally been kind of a more male dominant type um, region. And then you, the further North you go in Europe, obviously it's more, um, more tolerant, more open, more um, equal, right. You know, more, a little more um, sensitive to, to the male female balance. Would you say that maybe the U S and the UK are kind of leading the change or would that be too gross of a generalization? Maybe it's a little bit more of a generalization than I would feel comfortable making, but anecdotally in my experience, I have also found that to be true and talking to Paola and other Italian, I think Italy is where I've spent, um, Italy and Spain, I've also spent some time doing research and writing and um, especially a few years ago when Me Too was happening, um, I kept asking, are you seeing a change, are you seeing a shift? And I kept hearing now from, from those European friends and coworkers of mine. Whereas I think the answer was a little bit more optimistic here in the US at least, hmm. and also in the UK. Interesting. And I'm just thinking about some restaurants I've been to in Sweden and the UK, and I am remembering female chefs. So it's interesting. Yeah, it, it is a thing. Do you have, from, from the network that you've built, obviously writing the book, traveling around and so on, are, are you familiar with the situation in other regions of the world, like Latin America, Southeast Asia? Have you heard anything from those regions? Not as much. I, I, I hope that my research gets to bring me there, but I, I haven't traveled to Latin America and n not yet. Okay. You know, it's, it's interesting. A couple of years ago, I was in Chile and they took me to a culinary arts school just to, you know, cause that's what you do. You look and, and I think there was one woman in the class, one young lady and the rest were all guys. And um, wow, this is, this is a real thing. This is a, an issue. And you think about the 50 greatest restaurants of the world, you know, that those awards that they put out and they, they have the, the big award ceremony and then you, they have the, the images of all the chefs, right. You know, and they do the 50 grid and that's also mostly men. Yeah. I want to say the last few years, there have been less than a handful of women out of, yeah. out of dozens and dozens of men. So wow. um, yeah. What, what could women do? Um, I, I mean, I think, you know, we're both Americans, so we both, I think, understand the American culture really well and, and the, the processes and systems available to women in the United States. But um, let's think about Europe or, you know, other places. What could women do to, to be more involved and to, to fight for that greater balance? I mean, I think that that's a tough question because... I think these the things that lead to seeing all those 50 restaurants with 47 men or whatnot is such a such a systematic flaw um, that I feel like I think the women are I think women are doing incredible in my in my experience incredible things they're um, really creative and they're starting businesses and they're making incredible food and they're um, leading, leading incredible, important conversations. So I don't know if it's the women's responsibility or so much as um, maybe this is more of a um, global issue than just a European one, but making sure that restaurant work is a respectful environment, making sure people are uh, get get leave when they have a child, men and women. Um, just these sort of making making these places safe and um, positive environments for women to work. You know, you you talked about whether or not this is the woman's responsibility, and I'm wondering if it's um, I, you know, it could partly be that. But what about circumstances? So, for example, you had mentioned before the funding, the opportunities for loans, and that men to get, tend to get more loans and they tend to get larger loans, which blows my mind. I mean, I I didn't know that. So, are women not getting the funding, and why not? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think this is like that's certainly true in the U.S. and that's probably what I can talk to talk to most knowledgeably. Sure. Um, and it's also especially true of women of color and people of color. Um, I think it's just this traditional, like the, the, it's the, I mean, it sounds like such a like 
blanket statement, but the, it's the patriarchy. Like it is, this is the the world that we've grown up to, I and mean, women um, didn't weren't allowed to have their own credit cards until a generation ago. You know, so I think that these things just are the, the sea change is really slow, and then and and then it becomes right both sort of a structural trend and it also becomes sort of like in the imagination right that 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 chefs are are male and um so there's there's just a lot to undo Mm. i've always heard that banks really didn't like giving loans for restaurants anyway but i suppose if you are a, a bobby flay type person or you know some chef of renown and you have a bulletproof business model and you have some success already the restaurants or the banks will probably be more willing to to give you a loan but i don't know i just i think because i lived in portland and there's so many young budding entrepreneurs and everybody you know they'd all race to the bank for a loan and the answer was 100 percent no every time and i got to the point where i was just telling them you know don't don't even waste your time of course they would still go and the answer would still be no male female alike everybody so it's I, you know, that's the thing. I mean, banks just don't like taking that risk for, for the industry, but wow, this is, this is kind of shocking. Um, so is there an element between, or can we equate the number of female students in culinary schools and the number of female chefs working in the industry? Is there a kind of relationship there? I think there's a, sh- a, a, a turning point. So there's more and more women enrolling in culinary schools. I believe that the the CIA, the Culinary Institute of America, for the first time enrolled slightly more women than men recently. So I feel like that's a really positive, exciting thing. But when you look at the people who run kitchens and own restaurants, the head chefs and restaurateurs, I believe the numbers are around 80% male. Wow. So there's some somewhere along the way. And I think this is, but this is not just a restaurant thing. I mean, there's um, more women than men enroll in four-year colleges, yet, uh, you know, how many men are CEOs compared to women? It's just so out of whack. Yeah. So there's somewhere like along the road where women are dropping out of this industry. And um, it's definitely, it's definitely happening. Hmm. You know, that's interesting. Um, and I think I, I've heard more and more stories about the the men staying home to be the the dad, you know, and the mom goes to, to work and she's the bread winner. And I wonder if this is also kind of a paradigm shift where guys need to feel okay to, to be the, to act in the, you know, mom type role or the, the, you know, the parent type role while someone else goes and and wins the money for the house. And I suppose when you're brought up that, that you're supposed to be a leader, right. And that you're supposed to do thing, you know, destroy it, build it, destroy it. That's what men do, you know, go kill. Right. Uh, And then, you know, all of a sudden you're saying, well, no, you're going to stay home with the kid. And I mean, it's a shift. I think the patriarchy, it, it hurts everybody because not people don't belong in these narrow roles. Women yeah. don't and men don't. Uh, right. Some, some men should go be leaders and some should be stay-at-home dads and some should be both. And just that these things have to be determined by your gender is so confining and constricting and wrong, ultimately. Yeah. I guess the world itself has really changed. I mean, partly, you know, the whole Black Lives Matter thing really made everyone question everything. Um, and I guess it's just a matter of time. I mean, this we're not going to have quick change. You know, this isn't going to, it's not going to be a ro- rocky two years and all of a sudden everything's fixed. It's going to probably take a generation at least to see lasting change. I think that's definitely the case. And I think, um, there is something about the restaurant industry too that that seems to like lag a little bit behind it it is sort of an old school traditional place but i do they, i do see and believe that change is happening and those seeds right not only have been planted but are getting watered and tended to and um i i i, I really think the next generation's experience is going to be so different than mine or yours yeah yeah, well, let's hope so. I mean, I uh, definitely 
this has opened my eyes and it's definitely something that I want to start to talk to more people about. I think um, just as you have with your book, which I want to get to in just a minute, but the, we're, we're both in positions, I think, of influence in our respective industries. And if we can spread the word and let people know that, that you need to start thinking differently and behaving differently and embrace diversity in, in as many ways as possible. I mean, I, I recently heard a term, DEI, um, diversity, equity, and, oh, help me here. Um, Inclusion. There we go. Inclusion. Yes. And I thought, wow, you know, and, and it really speaks volumes to, to how the world is changing right now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about your book. Tell tell us about Plenty. How, you know, was was it this phenomena about the gender imbalance that that really set you down this path or had you always wanted to write a book or what was your inspiration for it? Yeah, I've always I've always loved to write. This is my second book. So um and I think I did have a little bit of of sophomore a sophomore slump fear or or anxiety. Um because your first book is something that you kind of think about for, for me anyway, most of my life was something that kind of marinates. And then it's like, oh, what's, what's next? Um, and this topic of women in food just felt, I felt so drawn to it. It felt so right for me. I've always written about food. Um, there's also a component of the book that's a memoir about my journey, um, starting my family. I, I um, wrote about my pregnancy loss and then, becoming pregnant with my daughter, who's now a year and a half old um, and kind of create. So it's like creating my fa- my little family at home and then creating my professional family amongst these uh, food and hospitality women who either were my friends and mentors or who I wanted to be my friends and mentors. And I think kind of became so in the process of spending time with them and writing about them. So I I spent time with um, Wendy, a um, a barge captain who has a little hotel boat that goes through the canals in Gascony and Bordeaux in the in um, in France. And I spent time with one of my my cheese heroes, Alison Hooper, who is the founder of Vermont Creamery in her. Um, beautiful Vermont farmland with all the goats. Um, oh, yes, yes, yeah. It's yeah, a beautiful yeah. So part it just, of the world. Yeah, lots of different adventures that took me lots of different places. And um, it was just such a, it was so fun to get to, to meet these people and dig into their lives work. And I, I still feel so honored that they trusted me to, to tell their stories. It's, it's fantastic. And you're just telling it from a different perspective, obviously, being a woman, having observed all of this, having traveled as well, and working, you've worked in so many different backgrounds that you've worked in food stores and restaurants. And uh, I think food manufacturing is one of them, too. I mean, you, you've done a lot. So you, you've really kind of looked at the, the issue from every possible angle, it seems. Yeah, yeah. I, so I started working in restaurants and I, 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 that took me many places and I, I did a restaurant management training program at a very corporate steakhouse, which was really uh, learned so much. And it was so, such a bad fit for my personality. Um, and then I moved to manage a restaurant, a family run fine dining restaurant that was so much more my speed. And in doing that, I kind of, had enough still searching to realize I still love, I I love restaurants. I love food. I want to be part of this world, but the day-to-day operations was not where I was passionate or where I was shining. And I've also always, always loved to write. And so I'm writing, right. Like doing this kind of um, copywriting and communications work also took me to different parts of, of retail and wholesale food companies where I got to work in that regard and see a whole different side of, of the food world. And so I feel really lucky that I've got to um, yeah, have all these really different experiences, but that like love for food has carried me through all of them. Yeah, you're right. The working in restaurants is grueling. And you were mentioning before about how it's very hard to raise a family. I mean, every not everyone, but a lot of people 
make fun of or joke around that it's hard to date a chef because they're never around. So <laughs> you really have to have a lot of patience, I guess, to, to be in a relationship with a chef, but I'm sure you'll, you do eat well though, when they're not working, right? <laughs> so yeah, you gotta... I mean, I found that, um, yeah. go, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. There's some delay there. Go ahead. Oh, finish I just your... found, um, yeah. I mean, even though I was, and I was young, like this was part of my life before I had a family or anything. And even so always working while the rest of the world is playing. It's really tough. And I started to miss, you know, you make wonderful friends in the industry, but I started to miss the friends and family who were civilians. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's a, it's a hard job. It's true. Now you wrote another book called um, Feast True Love in and out of the kitchen. What was the premise for that book? So Feast, my first book, um, is about a lot of uh, a lot about this early restaurant journey and kind of working my way through restaurants from from old school French fine dining restaurants to this corporate steakhouse to a cheese and wine bar um, and, and falling in love with food and it's also about um, struggling with and then ultimately recovering from an eating disorder. Okay. Uh, I can't see you at a corporate steakhouse. I, I really can't. I mean, you know, talk about uh, like an all <laughs> guys kind of, you know, get the cigars out and yeah, that, no, I, I don't even enjoy that <laughs> environment. So <laughs> it was a short, a short lived um, endeavor, but, yeah. but I did learn so much. So no, I mean, yeah, yeah. I think we, we, you have to learn something new every day, regardless of where you are, the circumstances you're always absorbing. Right. And you, ha- you uh, had an article appear in Wine Enthusiast as well. So tell us about that, because that's kind of, that's a big deal. Yeah, I also am a freelance writer. So I, I write for um, whatever publication will publish my work. And I, I wrote the story for Wine Enthusiast recently about the changing language that we use to talk about wine. And it was a short story, which was too bad because I feel like I could write maybe even like a whole book about this topic because as I got to interviewing winemakers and sommeliers, there was just so much to say. But um, the, the story was about how um, the sort of flavor profiles that we traditionally use to describe wine um, are just the beginning. And that as wine is becoming more accessible and more inclusive and more part of more people's lives, we're kind of changing the way that we talk about it. And um, it was really fun to dig into that. Well, give us some examples. What is this changing language of wine? So one of the exa- so one of the people I talked to is um, Alicia Towns Franken, who's a Boston wine person and wine consultant sommelier. And she grew up in Chicago and she was telling me that she always, like, saying the forest floor like she didn't the forest floor just didn't resonate with her she didn't really know what a forest floor smelled like the um, forest and floor? i think that that that's one of the one of the, so there's this like you know on the flavor wheel that they share with sommeliers that's what that's there are these kind of typical descriptors that get thrown around and that's one of them okay. and but but right, even your response. What what like you, you know that may or may not feel relevant to someone. Um, maybe you don't really know like what lychee tastes like. Some like, oh lychee. So instead of just kind of comparing um, one flavor to another, other ways to talk about it include maybe uh, kind of stepping back and just telling the story of like where the wine came from, who made it. Um, the way people just, one of the new ways that people talked about was talking about wine's personality. So is it like a, a charmer? Is it gregarious? Is it morally, you know, is it morally bad? What is, what is the, what is the wine's kind of, uh, yeah, what is the wine's personality? Um, or, or just kind of um, thinking about wine. One of the, one of the people I talked to who's actually in the book, Tammy, who's a sommelier who owns some restaurants in Brooklyn, was telling me she really likes to think about the body of wine with her staff, like 
like like like dairy like is it is it skim milk is it two percent milk is it half and half oh, no that's one of the ways it's a strange <laughs> comparison it's strange but i think when you're when you're like introducing when you're introducing this thing and just just kind of opening up the lingo and like the way that we think about what we're tasting and experiencing you know uh, do you remember the movie sideways a few years ago Yes, you remember the movie? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And the Santa Barbara Tourism Office, and they're also uh, with the Santa Barbara Film Commission, but uh, so they work together. But they did a promotion um, following the movie, which was basically, they tried to give their different wine varietals personalities. So if you were a Chardonnay drinker, you were like this, or if you were a Syrah drinker, you were like that. And they had a wheel. I remember it was a wheel and they were trying to get people into it. And I think it actually did really well. And I was just Googling, there's a, an article here sideways. Did the movie change Santa Barbara wine? So I don't know. It's, that's an interesting thought, right? Uh, what do you think that media can change the, the industry like that? Absolutely. I think it did. I think winemakers um, definitely talked about, Right in the wine in the movie, there um, they give Merlot such a hard time, right? And like yeah. Merlot sales really plummeted. So absolutely, I think um, we kind of get these messages and ideas about what we're eating and drinking absolutely from from media. And I think as a um, someone who writes about food, it's kind of a fun but serious responsibility to like shape that conversation about how people are thinking about and choosing what they're eating. And um, yeah. So I have to ask you, what, what bottle of wine are you drinking right now? Or what's open in your fridge or your house? Well, I'm not drinking any wine because I'm seven months pregnant. <laughs> okay. Well, what would you be drinking? <laughs> well, I've actually been, so I just wrote a story for Savor about non-alcoholic beer having a little bit of a renaissance. It's not something that I ever like thought about or, or, or experienced before, but now that I've been not really drinking and you know, you get so tired of like sparkling water and yeah, Diet yeah. Coke, um, sometimes like wants me to drink. And there's, so yeah, so I've been in, having fun exploring non-alcoholic beers. Let's see, we just had, um, I did just make, it was my mom's birthday and I, I made some scallop risotto and risotto is like one of the things that I really like to make. And we opened up a bottle of white Rioja that was delicious um, that I used a little bit in the, in the risotto and I did have a little bit and really enjoyed that. But I'm, I mean, I love trying new things. At the end of the day, I think my favorite is always bubbles like from champagne but okay. to beyond um I, i'm a bubble I, I i just something about the effervescent wines to me always feels like fun and i think they're so fun to pair they're so versatile they're not just for celebration they're for any time yeah for me it's got to be the right kind of bubbles i don't know i i don't call me pretentious but i do like dom perignon but apart from that i don't like other white bubbling sparkling wines i would like uh, a pink one for example a rosado a blush type sparkling mm -hmm. wine I, I, they, they seem a little more interesting to me than than just your standard white i i agree i i think yeah i'll usually look at the rosé pink sparkling yeah. wine options yeah. on the list too like it does seem like there's some really interesting possibilities there. Or if someone else is paying, then, you know, we can have the DP. That's fine. <laughs> now, uh, so um, how do you feel about Albarino? Because I just discovered an amazing bottle of Albarino. It tastes like other, unlike other Albarinos. I absolutely love it. I'm going to put the the name of it here in the chat so everyone can f try and find this. It's, I think it's spelled Chion, and that's, it's from Spain of course, and uh, it's an Albarino, and it's just, wow, it was such an interesting wine. Have you ever heard of that one? I haven't. I'm a fan of, uh, I'll have to try it. It sounds delicious. I'm a fan of Albarino in general, for sure, and I feel like um, they tend to have really good acidity, which tends to make them good for pairing with cheese, which is mm -hmm. something I, I do a lot of cheese writing and thinking 
thinking about. So um, I think that Alvarino is a really good friend to a lot of different cheeses. So the, for me, the difference between this Alvarino and others is that, do you know the difference between like an oaked and an unoaked Chardonnay? And when you finally have your first unoaked Chardonnay and your eyes open and it's, wow, it's like this, this is what Chardonnay is supposed to taste like, right? And it was kind of like this. This was a, a different from other Alvarinos and it was just really an interesting wine. So anyone in, in Spain listening, try that wine. It's, it's a good one. Um, now, we, uh, we're coming up to question time shortly in a few minutes, but um, we will be giving away a copy of your book, Hannah. Would you like to tell people a little bit about what they'll yes. be getting today? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So this is, this is the book, Plenty. Um, I feel like they did such a nice job with the beautiful it is nice, cover. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the, the story of you'll, you'll hear in more detail about the, the, the sommelier and the cheesemaker and the barge captain and the chef that I've come to know and love as well as my own story. And I hope, I hope you like it. I put a lot of my heart and time and soul into writing this book. So it means a lot to me. It's, and it's travel writing too. I, I um, only read an excerpt of it because I don't have a copy, but I went onto Amazon and you know, you know, you can preview the text and I just had to do the random sample because I couldn't even get the table of contents, but I got a random sample and there was you and your husband in Italy somewhere sharing um, something. And, and it was just, and it took me back to the days when I used to love reading travel logs and, and travel writing like that. It was, it's, um, it was very nice. So I think anyone who loves travel type stories, especially when it involves food will definitely enjoy this piece of work so we will be giving that away in about 10 more minutes and we'll be using a very scientific method to give away the book so we'll explain that <laughs> shortly um, so we we do have a couple questions here and uh, this one i thought was really interesting what is the role of media tourism marketing awards programs and the like in seeking out women for recognition people whose accomplishments are more recognized are also more likely to be awarded and to acquire funding. So what can media do to include more women? Absolutely. I think that media is definitely having a reckoning. I, I don't know if who has followed the, um, the sort of Bon Appetit uh, re, um, rebirth after some scandal, but um, I think that as, as writers and media people, which are interestingly enough, largely women, um, but that doesn't mean that we're immune to the cultural um, zeitgeist and to um, these old systems. And I think just asking the right questions all along the way Celebrate, you know, also celebrate. I think that, that we have to look deeper too as media people. Um, for example, when I was working in, in restaurants, I worked briefly for April Bloomfield and I was so excited to work for a woman chef. And she, she was the business partner of Ken Friedman, who was one of the, the Me Too restaurant people who was sexually harassing his staff. and. Um, Anyway, it wasn't, it was not a positive environment by any stretch of the imagination. And so just because we're women doesn't make us immune from being complicit. Um, so I, I, I just think that we have to, we have to keep like digging, keep asking questions, keep challenging um, and keep telling stories of people who maybe aren't the, the top the, the, the same faces we always see with the big funding and the big names and kind of look a little bit further and deeper into who else might be doing interesting things worth time and attention. Yeah. The media it can be very impactful, but also I think celebrities, whether they're Hollywood movie stars or celebrity chefs, are there any celebrities either in the industry or outside the industries that are helping to, to put the spotlight on this issue? I will always love um, Tom Colicchio. I feel like even though he's he's a you know he's he's a white guy, but I think he really seems everything that he writes and puts out into the world feels thoughtful and careful and um, 
And I think Top Chef is doing a great job of that. Like their last season was the most diverse one yet. I also really love Padma Lakshmi and her her new show and her work. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. I, I think more and more chefs. Uh, when the, you know, especially if you have a Netflix show or you're a YouTube star or something, you have the power to to change minds, to influence people, to plant a seed, right? And imagine there are there are young people, maybe they're teenagers, and maybe they like food, but they don't really know what they're going to do in their careers. And they start thinking, and then they see this show, right? And there's there's an idol, an icon for them that is inspiring them to maybe think about that, you know, maybe you don't need to go to one of those expensive four-year universities. Maybe you should go straight into the culinary arts program or hospitality management or something. I, you know, it's, um, that's, it's a big task. Yeah. I think another, another um, kind of famous-ish woman in food that I really love is Samin Nostrat, who has the Netflix show, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. And I feel like She's just a incredible young woman who's also very refreshingly not a model, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. just like a, a and who's celebrating food in this really genuine, fun, and also like substantive way. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that there's more and more ex to be excited about. You know, I, I um, am starting to see more ordinary people in advertising. And I don't know if it was Dove with the beauty bar several years ago that that was advertising ordinary looking people and women and, and not not the models, right? Because we don't all look like that. But to seeing just, you know, everyday people like that. And, and it's something, someone that people can relate to. It's uh, times are changing. It's kind of exciting to be at the forefront of all of this. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, we, when, right, when I, and that's something else that I love, like I really write about and care about. Um, and I didn't see, I, right, growing up, I saw only a very specific kind of woman represented, right? And I think that that change, even though there's so a long way to go, so, so long way to go, it's just so exciting and um, really heartening. Well, you're part of the vanguard of change. How exciting. Hope so. <laughs> now we have a, a comment here from Malta and Noel is saying there's only a handful of restaurants in Malta run by female chefs. None are found leading industrial kitchens and hotels, yet women appear to be more geared towards restaurant management. What do you think about that? Um, that women are maybe more appropriate for restaurant management or maybe they're finding their way into restaurant management more? I, um, I'm not, I'm not, this is not something that I knew about, but I, I'm reading the, I'm reading the comment. Um, that's really interesting. And I, and I do wonder like why that path maybe feels a little bit more manageable. And there, there are like a lot of little differences. Like for example, there's, um, so many more women leading pastry programs and who are pastry chefs than who are savory chefs. And for whatever reason that has been more, um, uh, yeah. And I do think that once that path is kind of carved, once you do see yourself um, in these leadership roles, once there are potential mentors, it becomes easier. So it, it makes kind of sense that, okay, maybe that's like the first in and then maybe yeah, maybe soon it will keep changing. Yeah, it kind of snowballs, right? When more and more successful women, those idols are, are coming to the forefront and more and more people say, wow, I can do that too. So we have another interesting question here. To what extent can we say that female-led kitchens could be considered as another special interest destination for the traveler? So the fact that, that people would go to the restaurant because the, the head chef is a woman. Yeah, I think that's like a, a, a incredible potential to plug into. Um, I do think people are care more about um, in these last you know years of food becoming more of a celebrity thing, more celebrated. People, I do seem to care more and more about who's making their food, mm -hmm. who are these people behind. And so I think if I was if I was a woman owned, if I had a restaurant, I think celebrating that fact to anyone who would listen would be something that I would do because it's important and 
um, I think travelers would would really care. You know, and I want to support. I, I agree. And I think it could actually become a marketing tactic. I mean, sometimes I have seen uh, at cafes, you know, this is a woman owned cafe, or you probably have seen too, this is a black owned business, those type of messages. Um, we we call it menu messaging when, when people use the menu for more than just the items that you can order to eat. So you talk about your catering business, you talk about the history of the restaurant, right? You talk about the chef's philosophy. And by the way, we're going to make a social statement here that this is a woman owned business, right? Or this is a business that hires um, disadvantaged ex-offenders or, you know, whatever, whatever the message is, the social message there. And I think that could actually be a, a strong marketing tactic. What do you think? Absolutely. I think, I think um, diners and travelers are eager to support women-owned businesses, Black-owned businesses. Diversity. And yeah. And yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I totally, absolutely agree. Yeah, I know a lot of people, well, not, I, I can't generalize like that, but um, I have been in situations where I've been with people who wanted to eat out and they have specifically sought out an immigrant owned business and not necessarily because they wanted that immigrant's food, but they know that this is is uh, managed by someone who, who came to the States, they had a rough time, they made it. Right. And it, it, it's not like the, the privileged American who could just go anywhere and talk to anyone. All of a sudden you've got your fa fabulous new restaurant and all this stuff. But no, they had a hard time. You know, you don't just come to the United States with a, a luggage full of cash and get going. Right. It's hard. And they they paid their dues and they, they did a good job. So um, let's give it. We have a couple more questions there, but let's go ahead, at, ahead and give away your book now. If, if uh, does that work for you? Sounds good. I know everybody's excited. So, so this is our entirely scientific method of doing this. Let me get all the windows. Okay. So we are going to use the almighty pen and I am going to close my eyes and I'm going to point to someone on the list here. So we have got um, a few attendees here. We've got people from I US, Sri Lanka, Scotland, um, Malta, South Africa and a couple people I don't know. So I am just going to point the pen and then we'll see where it lands. And then for the winner, I would say, send me your, your postal mailing address information. And then um, Hannah and I will figure out how to get the book to you. Cause I know some of you people in other countries. So, all right, you ready? Drum roll, please. Janet H. Janet H. Janet, are you hearing us? Can you just type into the chat window? All right. This is last time we did this. If the person wasn't watching, then we will do a backup as well, right? So just in case we don't hear from Janet. Howard W is the backup. So Janet H, first place if you get in touch if you don't by the end of the show then it will go to howard w sound good great all right, all right cool thank you and thank you for doing that i always love getting books and stuff it's so much fun uh we do have okay another question here i wonder whether you could unpack a bit the overlapping effects of the patriarchy and how this impacts the environment and kitchens i.e the gross undervaluing of care work no paid time off for elder care the macho militaristic structure and grueling hours can you unpack that a little bit yes um yeah there's a there's a lot there right there's, um, there's a lot going on there. <laughs> there's a lot going on there um yeah, I think they're all, right, those are all kind of these tightly interwoven aspects of a world that, I, let's see, so, so the restaurant kitchens, traditionally French, French restaurant kitchens were modeled after the military brigade system. And it's like a absolute, which I think also, you know, it, it's the military, it's war, it's, um, and it's this like absolute, um, authority and you do what you're told. And there's also sort of a, a hazing um, culture in place where the newcomers get treated abysmally. And then when they rise up through the ranks, it's kind of like fraternity-ish, right? Like 
that's what was done to you. So that's what you do to the next crop of young chefs. And it's, it's, it's a lot to uh, unpack. And I think it takes a long time to dismantle. Um, and then, and then right, like, you know, in the US, we're the only country in the we're one of very, a very, very small number of countries in the world and definitely the only one of the top richest countries in the world that don't offer any kind of, of um, federal parental leave. There's, not, there's nothing. I'm going to have a baby in a few months and I work for myself and I, I have to figure it out, um, which I'm incredibly privileged position that I can figure it out, but... It, this is not like set up for for people, women and and P, I think it's not just women. I think it's everybody, right? Because this, I think that this uh, negatively impacts everybody because it it counts success in such a very narrow way. And um, I just really believe that there's a that there is a better way, and that we can start to build this world that more um, supportive to the values that we have right now. Like we said before, it's going to take at least a generation to change things, but at least change is happening. It's moving in the right direction. People like you, people like some of the chef celebrities who you mentioned, uh, networks like Top Chef or programs like Top Chef that are, are helping people to see that it's not just about the white men. You know, or let's let's add one more adjective to that: the good-looking white men, right? Because we don't want any ugly people up there, right? I mean, you know, t times are right. changing, and right. and it's good that they are. All right, we have another question here, and and maybe this will be our last question, unless you all can send in some more questions for us. But this question is: What responsibility do diners hold in being willing to pay more for food experiences that support equitable working environments. Interesting. So mm. people want it, but then you know, you're gonna have to pay for it. So what do you think on, about that? Absolutely. Um, ooh, I also, that, that just brought, brought up for me, I have a recommendation for that sort of issue. Um, Alicia Kennedy's newsletter. She writes a lot about kind of social economic issues as they relate to the food worlds and restaurants. Um, so I, I just was remembering that she had a whole newsletter where she dug into that topic and um, people's ambivalence. And I think that's one of the, you know, we've been seeing during, we haven't talked much about the pandemic, but um, people not wanting to work for terrible wages for excruciating hours. And one of the costs as diners is labor. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I think that the, right, to the, she was, Alicia Kennedy was talking about, thank you for sharing the link. She was talking about the cost of making like a really fancy cocktail, right? And it's, um, it goes in a lot of places, but maybe we do go out a little less often. And then when we do, we're a little bit more okay with spending more, or I, I think it's, comp I think it's complicated. There's so many pieces of the puzzle and there's um, like so many people along the way trying to profit. Um, I know restaurants have really small margins and it's a really tough business to, to run and to, to make thrive. And so um, these are real and um, and it's, exp it's expensive to make good food, to pay people well, but it's also important. Absolutely. Those, those issues are all very critical. But could you imagine if, if the robots start taking over the kitchens? I mean, maybe the robots are going to be taking over everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're already taking over cafes in Japan. I mean, I, I keep thinking about that and wrestling my mind around it. And, and I guess in some fast food restaurants, robots are, are working as well. I mean, I, you know, the rest, the robots can't make a split second decision and say, oh, well, we're out of garnish. So I'm going to do this instead. Or, you know, we've got a gluten allergy. You know, I, can you imagine a robot thinking on, a, you know, changing on a dime like that and trying to figure things out. I'm not sure I could, not, not anytime soon at least. 
Uh, and Karen, thank you for sharing this link for the Alicia Kennedy newsletter. I'm going to check that out. That sounds like a very interesting resource as well. Well, um, I think that that is going to be a wrap for us for today, Hannah. Thank you for um, opening our eyes and really bringing this issue to light and helping us to understand that it is a thing and that we need to be thoughtful of it and do our part and see what we can do to help nurture better gender balance in our industry. Um, it's definitely something that I'm going to be paying more attention to. And I think it's the kind of thing where, you know, you go out to eat and you, you drop these little questions like, have you ever had women chefs here or is there a women chef? You know, those types of little questions that gets the business people, the, the servers, the owners, the mater D gets those people thinking, oh my gosh, you're right. We don't have any, you know, those types of things. And over time change will happen. So Hannah, thank you so much for thank taking you. the time today. It's been such a pleasure. You're so interesting. And I am so excited. I hope we get to meet in person one day, but for now, I'm just going to have to, uh, to make do with excerpts from your book. So thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Thank you. And everyone, thank you for uh, attending today. And we will be in touch with the winners offline. And that is a wrap for this month's Food Travel Talk TV. Join us next month. We're, we're going to be talking with Robin Shaw from Wine Tourism Australia, who is going to be talking about expected changes that we're going to see this decade in wine tourism. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week.